Well, thank you very much. I'm going to present you how to use the ultrasound dilution cardiac output method uh, practically. I won't show you any algorithms how to manage the patient hemodynamically since I'm a neonatologist, a pediatrician, and I'm not going to tell you how to treat the adult uh, patients. But I would like to know in the audience, is there anyone that measures cardiac output in children? Okay, thank you. Um, First, a disclosure, our research group received a research uh, grant for one of the animal experiments from uh, transonic systems and Pulsion. Well, I talked yesterday about the uh, principle of the ultrasound dilution uh, technology. First, we inject a small amount of isotonic saline uh, on the venous site that's been detected by the venous sensor and it's detected on the arterial side after it has gone through the patient and it's produced an ultrasound velocity and an ultrasound dilution curve from which the cardiac output can be measured. Um, because you cannot put the, the sensors into the body, you have to create an extracorporeal loop, and I've told you this, and I w want to focus on three injection sites because you've got one injection site on the arterial side, that's the AV loop flush. I will demonstrate you, uh, that to you in a minute. We got the redirection syringe. There is a, um, a pump, peristaltic pump, in the AV loop, and that's to prevent an unstable blood flow, so the measurement is accurate. But in the moment that you give an injection, the pump will uh, be faced with a higher pressure and it will stop. And that's what we would like to prevent during measurements. So we open a syringe that in the case of the injection, the blood goes into the redirection syringe and after the measurement, you can redirect the blood. And this is the point of injection of the isotonic saline. Well, this is a picture or a clip about how to use the OTCO system practically. Here you see the system, the patient, you can imagine an adult patient over here, it works the same, the monitor and the kit. This is the AV loop, it's aseptic, and we have to prime it first before you can use it. Here's the cassette for in the pump. You use normal saline with heparin concentration that you normally use in your patients, and prime the system. This is the, to connect to the arterial side, the venous side. This is the, uh, uh, the syringe for the flush, the cassette for the pump, the redirection, and the injection of the normal saline. How the measurement is being done, I will show it. First, you have to put the cassette in the pump. And you have to place the sensors on the AV loop. <coughs> This is the arterial sensor on the arterial side of the uh, uh, AV loop. You will put some petroleum jelly to, um, uh, to get the best acoustic signal, and it has to be put as near to the arterial catheter as possible. And the same must be done with the venous sensor, and you have to notice it should be in the direction of the flow of the blood. After that, you can start measurement. The pump is started. Blood is going to flow through the AV loop. And we take the isotonic saline that is warm to body temperature in a volume of a half to one cc per kilo. We open the redirection to prevent the, the pump to stop during the injection. The saline is injected into the venous side of the AV loop, stop the injection, stop the redirection. I personally like to have the time that the redirection syringe is open as close, uh, as small as possible, and these are the measurements that are within a minute on the screen of the monitor. As I told you yesterday, we do normally two measurements and only a third measurement when there's a, uh, uh, when there's a discrepancy uh, of 10% of more. After the measurements, we have to flush the loop again. With the uh,
flush out of the flush syringe, first the arterial line, the arterial line is closed. We redirect the blood that has been drained into the redirection syringe. And at the end, we start the pump again to flush the total AV loop. And after that, we can close the uh, stopcocks to the catheters. You can leave the AV loop on the patient for up to 72 hours. And you can take the cassette out of the, um, uh, the pump so you can use the system for another patient. And OK, what about the practical guidelines? You can use any catheter. Any peripheral arterial catheter, whether it's a radial, femoral, or uh, foot artery, and you use a multi-lumen central venous catheter, which you use the most distal and the largest port. You have to prime the AV loop with heparinized isotonic saline. Aseptic technique: you connect the AV loop with the intravascular arterial catheter at the straight port of the three-way stopcock and the sensors have to be placed on the specific places. And if the prime volume of the patient's arterial tubing set is more than half cc, then you have to use an extension set because the measurements are um, calibrated on uh, a small uh, volume of the tubing. The pump flow is set on 12 ml per minute. Use an indicator volume of half to one cc per kilo. You have to do a steady and rapid bolus injection Oh, I don't know what's happening. Sorry? It's okay. It cannot stay up to 72 hours. So now more general comments on the cardiac output measurement. What is measured by the system? I'm a neonatologist, and I told you yesterday that I'm confronted with a lot of patients who have got a left to right shunt. So. I think whatever measurement, whatever monitoring system you use for cardiac output measurement, you should know is there a shunt or not. Incidence on my intensive care unit is about 20 to 60 percent of a left to right shunt through a patent duct. If I'm, I also use the modified carbon dioxide FIG method. If I'm taking blood samples, venous and arterial side, and I measure pulmonary carbon dioxide uh, exchange, I have to know what the relation is to, from the shunt to the sampling site, because that will determine the value that I'm getting. Is it the systemic blood flow, or does it represent pulmonary blood flow? So for that, in my opinion, echocardiography remains essential whenever, whatever method you use to interpret the value that is to be obtained by the method. For example, in echocardiography, we do a lot in neonatology, if you measure left ventricle output, it represents the systemic blood flow, but also, in case of a patent duct, the ductal shunt. If you measure, measure the right ventricle output, it's a systemic flow, but if you, there's a patent foramen ovale, you can have the left to right shunt through the atrium. If you measure aortic flow, it depends whether your probe is in the descending or the ascending aorta, and you can measure SVC, the flow into the uh, superior vena cava, into the heart. It's called cardiac output, and neonatology used a lot as a surrogate for cardiac output. With the OTCO, um, we've done some uh, um, uh, animal experiments, and what we did is that we can detect a left to right shunt. You can see the difference in the dilution curve and we're trying to quantify the shunt. You will get a message of a left to right shunt within a specific range. Well, when, I, when we were on the animal lab uh, and did the validation study of the ultrasound dilution cardiac output, we noticed that every time you inject a certain volume of in indicator, half cc or one cc per kilo, we did see an increase in the pulmonary blood flow, which was measured by the transit time flow probes around the main pulmonary artery that served as a reference technique. After each injection, you see an increase in pulmonary flow, <coughs> and, re and, and an, um, it's going back. What we saw is that there was a closer agreement of the ultrasound dilution cardiac output with the peak value of the transit time flow in the pulmonary artery in comparison with the mean pulmonary blood flow. So I think not the actual cardiac output is measured, but 
the cardiac output transitly influenced by the indicator injection. This is not unique for the ultrasound dilution uh, cardiac output, but all methods that require injection of an indicator, even in a low volume of half C per kilo. How can we minimize the influence of the indicator injection? You can inject the indicator uh, into the central venous line as distal as possible from the heart. You can have the recording point, also, so the, the arterial catheter relatively distal from the heart, provided that the strength of signal is not reduced. The faster you will inject the indicator, the greater the chance will be that the cardiac output changes will be alleviated at the recording site, and the smallest amount, the smallest volume of indicator will cause the smallest distortion of the level of cardiac output. With the ultrasound dilution, we can measure hemodynamic volumes. We can measure total and diastolic volume, that's the volume in the heart. The central blood volume, it's the volume in the heart, lung, and the large <coughs> vessels. And we can measure the active circulation volume, which is the volume of blood in which the indicator mixes in one minute from the time of injection. Total end diastolic volume is what is in the peak of the global end diastolic <coughs> volume, and you can compare the central blood volume with the interthoracic blood volume with the pico. The total end diastolic volume is calculated by looking at the chord of the venous curve and the arterial curve. When you've got the large mixing chamber, the, the chord will be larger in comparison with a small mixing chamber. And this change is used to measure the total end diastolic volume. The central blood volume is the volume in, the scene, in between the sites of injection and of recording. And with that, it's used with the mean transit time. And the mean transit time has to be corrected for the mean injection time and the adjustment for time that the indicator travels through the tubing. At last, we've got the active circulation volume. That's the volume of blood in which the indicator mixes in one minute from the time of injection. At one minute after the injection, you can measure the exact concentration. Oh, sorry the exact concentration of saline in the blood after one minute and the active circulation volume can be measured from the injection volume and the factor H. It was interesting, it was presented on um, this uh, critical care congress that there was a discrepancy between the volume, par uh, volume parameters measured by ultrasound dilution and transpulmonary thermodilution was tested in 30 adult patients both on the UTCO and the PICO. And what we saw is that the global end diastolic volume with the PICO was slightly higher than with the UTCO. The global end diastolic volume was about two times higher than the total end diastolic volume with the UTCO. <coughs> Probably be the difference will be, can be caused uh, because in the, the, the non-diffusible indicator versus a diffusible indicator, and there are some differences in the assumptions and the mathematical models. Coming to the conclusions, I would like to conclude that the ultrasound dilution cardiac output measurement is reliable and easy applicable <coughs> in adults, in children, and newborn infants. I think any person who uses any method of cardiac output monitoring is obliged to thoroughly understand the basic principles of the applied technology and its respective advantages and limitations. Every new cardiac output monitoring should be thoroughly validated against the most accurate and precise reference method possible. To my opinion, <coughs> non-invasive cardiac output monitoring with a low accuracy and precision is dangerous. Regardless of the used method of cardiac output monitoring, it's of the utmost importance to be informed about potential intra and extra cardiac shunts to correctly interpret the assessed cardiac output value. Thank you very much.